You're welcome back. I hope you had a good break. Well, let's go over the limits. It is important we drill this home because all of calculus depends on this. So let's go over the last problems. I'll give you a clue to each one of them, and they're all different in their different respects. So watch what is going to happen here. For question number one, Abna gave us the answer. What do you do? Because the function is linear, it's not divided by anything, all you simply do is take this value here, put it wherever there is x. So you should have negative 1 to the power 4 minus 3 multiplied by negative 1 to the power 2 minus 7 multiplied by negative 1 plus 11. If you do all your calculations right, your answer should be 16. That is very straightforward. In other words, that whole function will get close to 16 as x gets close and close to negative 1. Question 2 is a bit different. It is rational. In other words, there is something at the top, there is something at the bottom. So in this case, if you look at it carefully, you notice there is a difference of two squares. So this will give you x squared minus 4 multiplied by x squared plus 4 all divided by x squared minus 4. Now, the clue is this. Very often, when these problems are given, it means by the time you have factorized, something in the denominator should be able to divide something in the numerator or vice versa. So in this case, this particular one strikes out. And because it has struck out, we cannot replace x wherever we find it. So we have 2 squared plus 4 and would have 8. The third problem is such that if we factorize the denominator, we should end up having x minus 1 in the numerator. And down here, because it's quadratic, if we did it right, you will have x minus 1, x plus 5. I have skipped a few steps, but if you know your quadratic, you know that this will take out this. So we end up with 1 on x plus 5. If we substitute with 2, then our answer will be different. So here we'll have 2 in the place of 5. Sorry, this should be negative 5, not positive. I beg your pardon there. So we have 2 minus 5. So it's actually 1 on x minus 5. So 2 minus 5 should give us negative 3. So we have 1 on 2 minus 5. And I beg your pardon. We have our technical challenge once again. Okay, so 2 minus 5, and that will give us 1 on negative 3. And it will be the same thing in case 4. In case 5, however, question number 5, it will be slightly different. You cannot factorize anything there. In that instance, what do you do? You divide numerator and denominator by the highest power of the variable. So in this case, it will be 7x squared divided by x squared all divided by 3x squared on x squared minus 4 divided by x squared. This will take out that. That takes out this. So we end up having 7 on 3 minus 4 on x squared. But look at the limits. It is tending to infinity. Look at it there. Tending to infinity. So 4 on x for on infinity to the power 2 will become 0. So we'll end up with 7 on 3 minus 0. We'll end up with 7 on 3. And that will be our answer there. Question 6 is different from all the others. And the answer doesn't appear obvious. But if you recall the first note, we say that if x tends to infinity and the power here n is positive, then the answer is very straightforward. It simply means that the limit does not exist. That's the answer. You see, that's all. Yeah, that's all. It doesn't exist. No need to solve for anything. It doesn't exist. Why? The limit is tending to infinity, and the power here is positive. So it will be infinite. It will not exist. All right. That is limits. We shall now go to something that you would 
come to appreciate. It is what we refer to as first principles. I love first principles. I love first principles. Because whenever you can understand anything from its original source, then you understand it. The first principles show us how we get our derivatives. So I'll begin with a trigonometric function, sine x. Now, we want to find the derivative of sine x. What do we do? We're going to employ something Leibniz gave us. He used the term h. I would not use h. I will use delta something. And I'll use the small alphabet, the lowercase delta. In your textbooks, you probably have seen the alphabet h used there. It simply means change, the small change. What would it look like? So we're trying to find out, we know, what's, we know what the limit, or should I say, the derivative of sine x is. The derivative of sine x is cosine x. By the way, the x is in radians, not in degrees. We can measure angles in radians or in degrees. This is measured in radians. So from first principle, what do we do? We say what happens, like to your parents' income, if it increases slightly, what happens to your pocket money? Or if it reduces slightly, what happens to your own pocket money? All right, so let's see what happens. If that function is called y, then y will be equal to sine x. That's our first equation. Now, let's add a little to both sides. A little of y, so your parents get a little, and probably you also get a little, so you are like sine x. So let's add to you. So let delta x, that alphabet, that's a Greek alphabet, delta. So that's delta x and that's delta y. That's the smaller version. The capital you probably know already is delta. In your textbooks, you may see y. I mean h, but I prefer to use a small letter. Now, this is just so that when you meet it anywhere, it's not new. All right, so there are increases in x and y respectively. Okay, if we increase it, we'll have y plus delta y equals to the sine of x plus delta x. Now, I have written something and equated it to two. I've written sine x cos delta x plus cos x delta x. Now, if you are not conversant with trigonometry, then this will look very, very confusing. Well, what I have written there is a trigonometric identity. We say in trigonometry that the sine of two on equal angles, say A and B, so sine of A and B is equal to sine A cos B plus cos A sine B. In the place of A and B, I have X and delta X. So I have sine X cos delta X plus cos X delta X. That gives me equation two. It is not a simple expansion. No, it is an identity. Something you should know. If you're in the first or second year, this may be a little strange to you. If you're in your final year, you may have come across this. All right. Now that we have this, what happens? How do we find the small change in y? So delta y. All we are doing now is making delta y the subject. We would have sine x cos delta x plus cos x delta y minus y. All we have done is to make delta x the subject from equation 2. All right. Note that we have minus y here. But we know what y is. From equation 1, we know what y is. So we'll substitute it. So we'll put equation 1 in 3. If we do that, we'll have sine x cos delta x plus cos x sine delta x minus sine x. Then we can group the terms. If we group it, we would have sine of x cos delta x minus 1 plus cos x delta x. Now, don't bother too much if you're in your first and second year and you do not appreciate this. It just tells you there is something to learn and it's exciting. If you're in your final year, I believe you're following at this point. Now, at this point, we need to do something. We are going to find delta x, sorry, delta y divided by delta y. And it means we're dividing each term by delta x. When we divide each term, we would arrive somewhere there. And this will be our final one. Now, it looks very, very scary. 
but it isn't. Watch what is happening here. We have just factorized sine x in the first case. In the second case, there was no sine x, so there was no need to factorize. Then, in the second line there, we're trying to find the limit of each part as delta tends to zero. As the change gets to zero, delta x tends to zero. You find out that in the first case, cos of delta x minus 1 divided by delta x will become zero. Now, this particular one will become one. That is a standard it's a standard relationship. If you are not used to it, never mind. But it will become equal to 1 down here. If we substitute it back there, then dy dx will become cos x. We have found a derivative of sin x. What do you do? All you do is write it this way, first of all. Equate it to y find the relationship here and expand this is a possible section b question paper 2 question where you'll be asked to find the derivative of a function from first principle of course in your multiple choice you will not be required to do this all right now that we know that derivative let's try for something like 4x plus 5 which will be much simpler so let f of x be y so we have y equals 4x plus 5. Let's call that equation 1. Now let's add a little to both sides. A little of y, a little of x. What is that little? Delta y, delta x. If we add those little in terms, we'll have y plus delta y equals 4 multiplied by x plus delta x. Because it was supposed to be 4x. But this time we've added something to it. All of that plus 5. If we expand 4 by x, you get 4x. 4 by delta x, you get 4 delta x plus 5. That gives us equation 2. Let's make delta y the subject. If we make it the subject, delta y becomes 4x plus 4 delta x plus 5 minus y. Again, we have minus y, and we can see y is equal to this here. So we substitute 1 in 3, and when we do, all of 1 comes and replaces this. So we have that there. If we open up, we have 4x minus 4x plus 4 delta x plus 5 minus 5. So we end up having equal to delta x. So 4x minus 4x, 0. Plus 4 delta x, 5 minus 5, 0. So it's equal to 4 delta x. If we divide both sides by delta x, we'll have delta y on delta x equals 4. And so as delta x gets to 0, our function becomes 4. So dy dx. Now you notice that I have dy on dx as opposed to delta y on delta x. Now the one in the square bracket at the top is what is happening to the change. But the one below shows what has happened to the entire function. In other words, if we differentiate. All right, you're welcome back. Sorry for that forced break. Well, we were trying to understand the whole idea of first principles let's take say a reciprocal function how would we derive the gradient function or the derivative from first principles take a look say we have a function f of x equals 1 on x we will do the same things we have been doing prior what would we do we we'll just make the function y so we would have y equals say 1 on x and then we would add a little to y and a little to x so that would give us y plus that little called delta y plus or equals 1 divided by x plus a little to x delta x now that we have that what do we do you realize we make 
delta y, the subject, and that's what we always want to do. We want to see what happens to the change, the ratio of the change in y to x. If x, if y increases and x also increases, what happens to the entire thing? So we're making delta y the subject. When we do that, you notice y is transposed to the right-hand side, so it becomes 1 on x plus delta x minus y. That gives us equation 3. But we know what y is. It's from equation 1, so we substitute it. When we do, we'll have 1 on x plus delta x minus 1 on x, because 1 on x is y. I found the LCM, which is this. And it produced x minus 1 in bracket x plus delta x. When we expand, we have x minus x minus delta x divided by the LCM. x minus x would be 0. So we end up having minus delta x all over. I just chose to expand this. So I have that. I have x squared plus x delta x. Now, what am I trying to do? I have rewritten this. In exponent form, so all of this has been rewritten, and I have it in this form. Having rewritten all of that, my equation now looks like this. My point now is to divide all sides by delta x. When I do that division, I end up with negative x squared minus delta x. So, as delta x approaches 0, dy dx, which is the derivative, becomes negative x squared, which can be written in the fraction form 1 on x squared. So, it doesn't matter what the function looks like, whether it's trigonometric, linear, polynomial, or quadratic, or reciprocal, like this case, the same procedure, add a little bit of each of them, and then do your expansions, your grouping of like terms, then apply the concept of limits. You notice we have used limits throughout. All right, so what are the general rules of differentiation? These are the general rules. Number one, the derivative of a constant is zero. The derivative of a constant is zero because there is no change, it's zero. Now, I have written Notation f prime of x. It is another way of saying dy dx. So I could write dy dx or simply f prime of x. So the derivative of a constant is zero. Secondly, the derivative of say y equals x exponent n is, watch this, watch what is happening here, n, which is the power multiplies the coefficient. The coefficient of x here is 1, so it becomes n. n by 1 is n. Then I subtract 1 from the power, so I have n minus 1. So long as n is an integer, positive or negative. So if you're asked to differentiate anything, and it is something of the form y equals x to the power n, all you need to do is multiply the power by the coefficient, then subtract 1 from the coefficient. We'll do a few examples. If it is, the power is more than 1, so it is a, and maybe it is 2, 3, negative 1, same thing applies. So the third rule is just an amplification of the second rule. So whereas here, because it was 1, I simply left it that way, it could have been another number, say a. So you have n multiplied by a, a n, then n minus 1. All right. What if it is a product? So you have a function, I mean, a function multiplying another function. That's a product. In that case, we have what we call the product rule. The product rule says that the function will be to hold you, differentiate v with respect to x, and add v held, differentiating u with respect to x. So you notice u here, u there, v here, v there. When I hold u, I differentiate v. When I hold v, 
I differentiate u, all of them with respect to x. So sometimes we simply say u dv plus v du, all the time with respect to x. Now, the x and y are only because we're used to x and y. If you have um, distance and you're differentiating distance with respect to time, and distance is given s and time t, it will be ds dt. It's not always x and y. Depends on the two quantities you are checking out. If it is displacement or distance and you represent it by x and time is the other value, then it is dx, sorry, ds dt. All right, so this is the product rule. Please note it, u dv plus v du. I have said it in the short form. It is holding u, differentiating v with respect to x, plus holding v. When I say hold, I simply mean don't do anything to it. Just leave it as it is, then differentiate the other one. you see a few examples, and I hope you'll get it. Plus, you're holding or keeping v as it is, and differentiating u with respect to x. Then, there is the quotient rule. This time around, one function is dividing another. In that case, you have the quotient rule, which is a little more complicated. It's almost like the first, except that this time around, you hold v first, differentiate u with respect to x, minus, not plus, minus, you hold u, you differentiate v with respect to x, divided by the square of v. Don't bother about how we came up about it. For now, use it as you, you, you understand, it, as we have it. Subsequently, as you go on, you'll be able to appreciate how we came about this. It's from first principles. All right. Then, the derivative of something like y equals ax plus b all exponent n, this time around, we have something we call a composite function, if you like, a chain function. So it's a chain rule. What do we mean? When we say ax plus b exponent n, we are simply saying ax plus b multiply it as many times as n is. So if n were 2, we'll multiply ax plus b by another ax plus b. If n were 4, we'll multiply ax plus b four times. So this time around, it means that it is dependent, it's a function dependent, another function. So we deal with it in what you call a chain rule. And this time around, it will look this way. First of all, you differentiate, you can call this u, all of it, Differentiate it with respect to x first. Then you can now deal with the whole function by themselves. A few examples to clear all of it. So let's go. Let's illustrate it. So y equals 5. Let's find its derivative. Remember, it is a constant. So its derivative f prime of x straight away is 0. So when we differentiate any constant, it is 0. You don't do anything about it. It's just 0 straight away. What about y equals x cubed? This time around, it's like x to the power n. So you multiply 3 by the coefficient, which is 1. You get 3. You take 1 from the power. So you have 3 minus 1. So the derivative of y equals x cubed equals 3x squared. So we simply multiply 3 by this and then subtracted 1, as we have here. So we have 3x squared. That is the derivative. Let's try another one. So 8x to the power 5. The same thing is going to happen. This time around, it's like ax to the power n. So 5 multiplied by 8, that's how we have here. That gives us 40. Then 5 minus 1, we get 4. So it becomes 40x to the power 4. I guess you're getting it. All right. What about this? y equals 1 on 6x to the power 4. When you have a problem like this, it's usually um, helpful to, to, to reciprocate it and write it more in the terms of indices. So this would be more like 6, um, something like the x to the power negative 4. Not quite so, but just for your understanding here, the power now changes from positive down there, it becomes negative. So just assume this was not it and it was this, you end up having your answer as negative 24 
x to the power negative 5. I guess you're getting the drill. All right, so all you need to do is the power, the exponent, multiplied by the coefficient, then you subtract 1 from the power. All right. What about this? This is where you have something like uv. So this is more like u, and this is more like v. So you hold, so we have it here, u, and we have v. So when you hold u, you differentiate v. When you hold v, you differentiate u. So if we differentiate u with respect to x, du, the x, will be 3 by 2, 6. And then, if you subtract 1, you get 2. If you differentiate v with respect to x, the power here is 1. 1 by 3 is 3. 1 minus 1 becomes 0. So we have this. So if we apply the rule, so we have u dv dx plus v du dx. So we hold u, we have held u, differentiated v, we held v, differentiated u with respect to x. If we expand and simplify this, we end up with 2x to the power 3, 24, x to the power 3, plus 24x to the power 2, minus 15. By the way, you could have solved this same problem by initially expanding y at the very beginning. But sometimes it becomes very laborious, so we employ this technique to shorten the process. All right, so that is how to differentiate. Okay, what about this? y equals 2x cubed minus 5, all divided by 3x plus 4. This is a quotient rule where it is more like saying y equals u on v. So again, we hold v, differentiate u, minus, this time around it's quotient, so minus u, help hold u, differentiate v. So I have done the initial work. u is this, v is that. I differentiate, I get those things. And I replace them in the standard equation there. So if I replace them, that is v held. I differentiate u minus, I hold u, differentiate v, divided by the square of v down here. If I expand the numerator, I get 18x cubed plus 24x squared minus 6x cubed plus 15 divided by that. If I group them, 18x cubed minus 6x cubed, I get 12 and all of that. So, you could simplify even further if you wanted, but this is just to give you an idea of how it works. Always remember this. That is the quotient rule. All right. We could go on and on. The chain rule. So here, you notice I have the power. So what do I do? First of all, I make this one another variable. I call it, say, u. So let u be 5x squared minus 2, what is in the parentheses. So I differentiate u with respect to x. So I get 10x there. Then I differentiate the entire thing. So I'll have y, since I have called 5x squared minus 2y, I mean u, it becomes y equals u cubed. If I differentiate y with respect to u, I have 3u squared. So 3 here multiplied by the coefficient, I get 3. If I take out 1 here, I get 2. So 3u squared. So what do I do with all of this? Well, this is what I do. Again, take note of this. So the derivative will become dy dx, which is the derivative, become du, dy du multiplied by du dx. Why do I do that? Because I know this and this will go out and I'll be left with dy dx. I have found the u dx. I have found dy du. So I can replace them. If I replace them, I have 3u squared plus 10x, and that will give me 30u squared. But I know what u is, so I replace it. I end up with 30 in bracket 5x squared minus 2 all to the power 2. Let's take that again. Make what is in the parentheses here u or any alphabet, but usually we like u. 
to the power 3. So that is what I have here. I differentiate what I have made u with respect to x, I get 10x. Then I differentiate the new relationship y equals to u cubed, I get 3u squared. Then I apply dy dx equals to dy du multiplied by du dx. dy du gives me 3u squared, and du dx gives me 10x. 3 by 10, 30, u squared by x, 10x. So actually, there should be an x somewhere there. So, but I know what u is. u is this. So I just replace it. And we have our chain rule beautifully applied. All right. The last bit of things. We have something called the implicit function. What do we mean by an implicit function? And anything implicit means it is buried within. So let's say I say Mary is a girl. Mary is a girl. Now, I need not say that unless, for example, there is a certain culture or somebody's nickname or moniker, he is chosen to pick a he, choosing the name Mary as his name. Ordinarily, Mary should be a girl, female name. So if a man or a male bears the name Mary, that would be a bit unusual. So buried in the very name Mary is the assumption that she is female, or it is a female we are referring to. An implicit function is a function that cannot be directly referred to by one particular variable. In other words, you cannot say y equals this or x equals that. It's a bit mixed up within. It is found within itself. So let's see an example on the screen. It says that given that x squared plus y squared equals 4xy, find dy dx. In this case, we're being asked to find a derivative. I have the full solution on the screen. What did I do? Differentiate x squared, you get 2x. If we differentiate y, remember each time we're differentiating with respect to x. However, because this time around it is y squared, even when we differentiate to get 2y, and the differential will still be repeated. So we have to write 2y dy dx. Notice how I say it, dy dx. Subsequently, we will talk about higher derivatives. All right, it's equal to 4xy. 4xy is a product. So we'll deal with it using the product rule. So we hold y, differentiate x, hold x, differentiate y. So we have v du plus u dv, and that gives us 4y plus 4x dy dx. Well, we group terms so that dy dx stands alone, and I put it to the right-hand side. So I have 2x minus 4y equals 4x dy dx minus 2y dy dx. And I factorize dy dx in this line. When I do that, I notice I can divide both sides by 4x minus 2y, which I do in the subsequent line. So I have 2x minus 4y divided by 4x minus 2y equals dy dx. And I notice that to the left, I can factorize, I can factor 2 out in both the numerator and the denominator. When I do that, I have two outs in both cases. So finally, I have my, my function being differentiated to become x minus 2y all on 2x minus y. This is an implicit function because I could not write the function itself as x equal to or y equal to. Everything is related to everything in some way. That's an implicit function. You get to meet them every now and then. All right. Just to mention something quickly, that these are standard derivatives. These are standard derivatives. So the derivative of a constant, I choose my constant as c. Some books have it as k. It doesn't matter. They are just um, constants. The derivative of any constant is 0. The derivative of ax to the power n is a n x to the power n minus 1. We have just dealt with that. The standard derivative of sine x is cosine x. The derivative of cos x is negative sine x. And the derivative of tan x is sec or second squared x. Remember, all the x are in radians for the trigonometric function sine, cosine, and tangent. 
make a quick note of this. There are lots more, but for your level, this is how much you'll be needing. We shall open the phone line shortly and give you an opportunity to answer a few questions on this. I hope you dare to do it. And please be courageous about it. So these are a few for you to do when you call. Just tell me what you have as your answers. Let's confirm them together. So the phone lines are open 0302 211 0302 211 Hello, good evening, Emmanuel. Good evening, sir. Emmanuel, you're back, right? Yes, sir. All right, so Emmanuel, which one are you taking a shot at? I'm taking and I'm one and number two. One and two, okay, go ahead. So, Emmanuel, what do you have for one? So one is 4X. And if you can say 2X, but you get 4X. Right, Emmanuel, you're right on that. 4X, correct. Yes, number two. So, number two, you get 6X minus 1. Emmanuel gets two out of two. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. Okay. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. So, Ima class number one and two for us. Who dares three, four, five, six, seven? So, we have three, four, five, six, and seven. Hello, Ray. Hello. Good evening. Good evening. Please, where are you calling us from? Kumasi. All right. What school do you attend, if I may? Kumasi High School. Oh, great. So, which of the questions do you want to attempt? Kumasi High School. Oh, great. So, which of the questions do you want to attempt? Hello? I seem to be losing rain. All right, Rain, you said number four. Yes, please. Okay, so number four. Take your shot. Let me hear you. What do you have for number four? Number four, I have six. What do you have for number four? Open bracket, x square minus one, all to the power two. Can you take that again? Six. X squared minus 1, all to the power 2. Um, it appears to me you are missing something. So look at it again. Something small. You're missing something small. Take a look at it again. Rain, take a look at it again. Something very small. You probably have written it down, but you are saying it differently from the way you, are, you have written it. Can you see it? Hello, Rain. Hello. Yeah. What did you do? Tell me your procedure so that I help you identify what you left out. Six X. Good. Now you get it. Six X. Yeah. Six. Yeah. To the power four. Oh, no. Okay. You have expanded everything. Okay. Rain, Rain's line is breaking, so he's saying something I can't really get. I wish I really heard you clearly. Well, let's see if somebody bails rain with a better line. He's trying to answer question four. And he came very close. I suspect he was saying the right thing, but I cannot hear him. And so, I'm sorry, I cannot tell if he's right or wrong. But it would be great to hear from somebody else. 
we have questions. Prosper, good evening. Good evening. Prosper, please, where are you calling us from? I'm calling from Angloga. Angloga. That's great. What is the name of your high school if you are in one? Amteko. Oh, Amteko, great. So now, talk to me. Which of the questions do you want to attempt? Let's question, question six. Question six, great. So what do you have for question six? It says sine for x. Find its sine derivative. X. What would you have? Yeah, I got four. Yeah, I got uh, four cos four x. Brilliant, you are correct. The answer to that is four cos four x. You are correct. Thank you very much. Ghana, put your hands together for Prosper. Thank you very much, Prosper. That was a good one. Yep. All right. So we get question one out of the way. We have four x here, and there we have six x minus one, and here we have four cos four x. All right. So we have three. Oh no, Emmanuel, you're back. Hello, Emmanuel. Hello, sir. Is that Emmanuel from Takradi still? No, sir. Oh, this is Emmanuel from? Benso. From where? Benso. Okay. All right. So, Emmanuel, talk to me. What is the name of your high school? Uh, Benso Senior High. Oh, great. So, which of the questions do you want to attempt? Question four. Question four. Great. So, tell me, what do you have question four? So, dy dx is equal to 6x. All right. Open bracket. Yep. S square minus one, all yep. square. Fantastic there, Ima. Fantastic. That is correct. That is correct. You apply the chain rule, I suppose. Correct. Thank you very much, Ima. You are right on that. So we have this also sorted out. We have the 6x in brackets, x squared minus one, all to the power two. Thank you very much. All right. We'll pause on the course. And I believe you can try any of them and verify with friends and everything we have done so far. Let me quickly point out at this point that integration, which is the next thing we shall be dealing with, is a simple reversal of what we have been doing so far. So in integration, what do we really do? We simply find the function whose derivative we now know. And... In the time left, it will be impossible to treat all the possible applications of differentiation or integration. But let it be enough to say that whenever there are two quantities that are related, and we can write the relationship between those two quantities by an algebraic expression, then we have a function. So for example, the velocity of a moving vehicle can be expressed in terms of its displacement and time. So the differentiation of the function s with respect to t will give us velocity. So as displacement changes with regards to time or with respect to time, we have velocity. Now if velocity changes with respect to time, what do we have? That is acceleration. So you notice that we can differentiate displacement with time we get velocity so it's like if we refine crude oil we get petrol or diesel and if we refine diesel which is the first thing we get for example we could get some other things maybe candle wax or something all right or maybe a finer chemical for those of you who are chemistry students you know that we have fine chemicals which are a further processing of an original chemical we have so a derivative could even go higher. And in that case, we'll say something like d2y dx squared. It means we've gone to the second level or d3y dx cubed. Now, that is for y and x. But if it was, say, trying to find acceleration from displacement and time, we will say, first of all, ds dt, where s is displacement or distance, t is time. So how does displacement change with time? What's the ratio? We call that velocity. What about velocity with time? That gives acceleration. So if you have a problem and you are required to find, say, the derivative of displacement with time, that would be a practical application. We call that kinematics. 
What if we have acceleration and we want to find displacement or distance? What do we do? We reverse that by what we call integration. Now, I'll touch on that very briefly as we get along. So, some of the applications are things like small changes, something I have singled out for mention. So, for example, if the change in your parents' income as comp in comparison with the money you get, the change in your own income, so from, say, 100 cities to 105, as opposed to what your, I mean, your parents also had an increase in their salary from 1,000 cities to 1,050 cities. As we compare very small changes, it is approximate to the function dy dx. I'll give you an example so that you understand. There are so many applications of differentiation and integration, we cannot exhaust them. So I've given you the general concept. So we have something like that. So look at this problem. The radius of a circle is four centimeters. Find the increase in the area of the same circle when the radius expands by say 0 0.01 centimeters. You notice that the expansion of the radius is very small, 0 0.01. How much would that affect the change in the area? The area of a circle is given by pi r squared. We know that. So, the area would increase slightly. We'll call it delta A, the small increase. And the radius increases slightly delta R. If we use that relationship up there, it will mean that the area pi r squared, if we differentiated it, the A, the R, would be 2 pi r. And I hope it rings a bell, 2 pi r, yeah. That's the circumference of a circle. All right, so if we differentiate the area with respect to the radius, dA, dr, we get 2 pi r. And if we use that relationship up there, we can say that dA, making dA the subject, it will be, sorry, uh, delta A, I beg your pardon. So dA, dr, multiplied by the small change in r, Delta d a d r will give us 2 pi r, and the small change in r is what we're given as 0 0.01. So 2 pi, the radius was 4, multiplied by the small change, 0 0.01, gives us approximately 0 0.08 pi centimeters squared. Of course, you can find the value for pi 22 over 7 or 3.14 and multiply, and you get something without pi. But I choose to leave my answer with pi. So what does this answer mean? It means that as the radius, whatever it was originally, 4 centimeters in this case, increases to, say, 4.01, the area of the circle will now become whatever it was originally plus 0 0.08 pi centimeters squared. That is one application of differentiation. This is one application of, of differentiation. And there are a lot more applications. Like I mentioned, the principle, the key here is, please try locating the relationship that exists between the things you have. I'll do a quick run. I'll let you see how integration works. So look at this. So given a function, say, f of x, its derivative as equal to ax exponent n, its derivative will be a n x exponent n minus 1. The integral will be the reversal of it, the antiderivative. So if this is the function dy dx equals to the derivative a, dy dx equals to a n x exponent n minus 1, then dy by simply cross multiplying, it will be a n x exponent n minus 1 multiplied by dx and would integrate both sides. Now, that S sign or S looking sign, um, thanks to Leibniz, he viewed it as summation because integration, like integrated signs, is putting so many sciences together. So, you are summing up the entire range of things. If we integrate y, we get dy, we get y. If we integrate this here, we get what we have down there. It is written that way. Now, this is called an indefinite integral. It is indefinite because um, we don't know exactly what it will be. So many functions could look like this. When there are limits, it means there's something above here, say B, and something above, below here, A, then we have 
a definite integral. All right. So the function or the integrand is the thing inside there. So watch this. That is the integration sign. We have there the integrand, which is the thing we're about to work on. The integral is our final answer. And then we have that C that makes it arbitrary. That's why it's called indefinite. In the other case, we have A and B as the limits. And we can solve a few questions. So these are the parts of the integration you will be working with. All right. So we have lots of problems we could have solved. For example, if we have given that f of x equals 4x squared minus 5x plus 5, sorry, plus 2, and we are asked to find the coordinates of the points where the gradient is. Recall that when you differentiate, what you get is called a gradient function. So in other words, it's a gradient. And the question says that when we differentiate, that gradient function is 11. Let's solve it. So dy dx would integrate 4x squared, we get 8x. Differentiate negative 5x, we get negative 5. Differentiate positive 2, it becomes 0 because it's a constant. So our derivative is now 8x minus 5. But the problem says that that gradient is equal to 11. So we equate 8x minus 5 to 11. If we group like terms, 8x will be 16 and x will be 2. But we're not looking for only x. The question says find the coordinates. The coordinates. So there must be an abscissa and there must be an ordinate. The abscissa is 2. What is the ordinate? You put it back into the equation. If you do that, you have f of 2 will give you 4 multiplied by 2 squared minus 5 multiplied by 2 plus 2 and you get 8. In other words, the coordinate is 2 and 8. So this is one other application of differentiation. So you can find coordinates of points, you can find gradients, and you can even find equations of lines remembering what you have done in your core math that all you need to find to do to find the equation of a line is to have a point and a gradient. A point and a gradient. So if you can find the gradient function by differentiating, then you have the gradient. If you can find Anything, you just need a gradient and a point, and you find the line. Maybe a last question we'll do here. The gradient of the curve y equals ax squared plus 3x plus 2 at the point where x equals to 2 is 11. Find the value of a. So this time around, what we have here is a problem where we, we, we are supposed to know what the function is, but something has been taken out. Fortunately, we've been given something else. So we're going to differentiate y with respect to x. When we do, if we differentiate ax squared, we get 2ax. We differentiate 3x, we get 3. And the question says that the gradient of that curve at the point when x is 2 is 11. In other words, 2ax should be 11 at x equals to 2. So instead of 2ax, we have 2a multiplied by 2 equals 11. That gives us 4a equals 11. And so we know that A is 11 on 4. So again, a similar kind of question, we solve it in a different way. These questions are common questions you will meet both in your multiple choice questions 1 to 40 and in your written questions, both compulsory side 1 to 8 or from question 9 all the way to 13 or 15 thereabout. So if you have had a grip of this, all you need to do is to learn how to reverse the process. Re the reversing of the process is called integration. All right. On the 8th, on the 9th of this month, at least in Ghana, I know, you will be taking this paper. This is one key area you will be encountering. Calculus. We have dealt with limits. We found the limits under different conditions. We've been able to differentiate from first principles. We've been able to tell the standard differentials from different angles. We have not integrated as much as we'd love to, but you know that you can just reverse the process. And we have applied differentiation. It is my pleasure to always bring you this, and today was no exception. I hope that you can revise using what we have learned, build on it, 
And please walk into that examination hall in the next one week or so with a lot more confidence. And I wish you all the best in your preparations. It's been a nice hour of revision. My name, as always, is Danso. I'll be with you again very, very soon. Have a pleasant evening. Bye. Thank you.